welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. I'm Pookie Knightsmith and I'm your host. Today's question is, how can boarding schools support children returning to school after lockdown? And I'm in conversation with Sue Bailey. So I'm Sue Bailey. I'm the head of Queen Margaret School near York. Queen Margaret's is a boarding school for girls aged 11 to 18. Um, I've been the head here just for a year, um, but in a previous life, I've run a boarding house um, and I've been working in boarding schools for about half of my career. And the other half of my career, I've been working in pastoral care uh, in uh, big day schools. So a background in boarding and in day schools. And always, yeah, with kind of children, young people's well-being and staff actually mm. um, right at the heart of, of what you've been doing. And that's how we've come to know each other over the years. I guess. That is, that's right. Yeah. Um, so we wanted to think today about the specifics of children who are boarding and how boarding schools can support those children and I guess their families as well as we come to the kind of wider return um, after lockdown. And I kind of wondered what your mm. initial thoughts on this are. You're having to think about this as a, as a head and as a mum as well. Mm. I think my concern really, uh, the, uh, the heart of my concern is just the length of time that um, children have been away, young people have been away from their boarding homes um, and their boarding lives. Um, I think for most young people, boarding is, is a, their boarding school is a second home um, and they, they feel very comfortable uh, there and they, um, they don't see it as an alternative, they just see it as an, you know, as an added um, but they haven't been in the routines of home in boarding for six months by the time they, they come back to us in September. Many of them will have left in a hurry as the schools close down. Um, so, um, and quite a few, of course, will have gone abroad as well um, and will be coming back from homes overseas. So um, it's hard to be away from home and come back and just come back into routines and feel comfortable in your second home when you've been away for so long and particularly when you've been away and been with your parents and been in a very different environment for such a long time. And do you think that there are things that you can do like during this time in, in the kind of the lead up to it or will it all be about what happens when uh, young people arrive back mm. on site with you? I've been thinking quite a lot about this actually. I think um, there's quite a lot that we can do as schools before the start of term um, just to allay fears I think one of the, the, the key things that we have got to remember as school leaders is that whilst we've been um, deep into regulations, into trying to predict the COVID world and trying to work out you know, if we can make um, classrooms work at two metres, if we can, you know, how dorms might be organised and things like that, whilst we're really into it, um, actually the children aren't, the young people aren't. They've not read the regulations, um, nor of their parents, most of them. And they won't have thought through any of the, um, the, the issues that might arise, or indeed they'll have thought through and not know the answer mm. and, feel very, and, and feel very uncertain about what they're coming back to. Well, how is it going to work when there's, um, you know, there's usually six, five of us in a room? How's that going to work now? That kind of thing. Um, so I think the key thing is not to assume they know. Uh, and I, I, and um, you, every decision that's been made in schools um, may well have been communicated to parents uh, and staff, but even if, if there's been attempts to communicate that to young people, um, over the course of the summer holidays, that will have just gone in one ear and out of the other. So I think there's a lot of preparation that we can do in terms of um, little videos, little walkthroughs when you arrive in school, this is how uh, this is how it'll look. We're going to um, ask your parents to park their cars here. Um, your house mistress will take you to your boarding house. However, however the schools are going to run that, and then also reassuring them about the hygiene systems, the one-way systems, dining. Those things matter to all children when they're coming back to school in September. But for boarding children, um, you know, it's it's twenty-four-seven. So. They want to. They really want to understand. Well, how will it be if I want to go? If I want to get a hot chocolate, how will it be when I'm going down to breakfast and meeting my friends from a different boarding house? Or how will it be? Normally, we're all. You know, are we in bubbles? What's a bubble? How are we going to bubble? How can I hug my friends? 
the, in a girls' school, the girls constantly hugging each other. It's, just, it's kind of what they do. Oh, it's lovely to see you. And um, they need some reassurance and some guidance and some preparation. And I think actually videos work quite well, little YouTube clips, because they can watch them as many times as they want to. Yeah. And get that sense of what's going to happen. And what is it going to look like? I mean, are they allowed to hug mm. each other? Are they, what does happen if they want to go and get a hot chocolate? I mean, what are the answers mm. to some of these questions? <laughs> and actually the answers are pretty, uh, you know, reassuring. Um, most schools are operating in a, in bubble systems. So they're going to uh, operate in year group bubbles. For boarding schools that are used to a more uh, vertical system of boarding. So they're uh, where they have um, children from year, each year group within one boarding house quite a few of those schools will, are, are moving to horizontal boarding so that the bubbles are intact and they would have told their parents about that already. Um, but once they're in their bubble, then um, their distancing is uh, less controlled than it, needs, than it need be in, um, in a work environment, an adult environment, for example. So uh, in our boarding houses, uh, our year groups are bubbled, our boarding houses are bubbled. We well, um, we will, where we can put some distance in dorms, we will. So some of the dorms may be a bit more spacious than the, than the girls are used to, but they will be in dorms still. They're not going to be in individual cells because I think government regulations have allowed us to make a judgment about what's right for, for, for young people. Um, and for me, um, it's really clear that, the, that what's right has to balance emotional health and well-being against um, COVID risk it's not one or the other and there's a balancing to had to be had and um i can't i i i have no interest in um having young people in a situation where they feel entirely isolated in their second home as a result of being put in single rooms for example and things like that when they want to be with their friends so um there will be precautions in boarding houses in terms of shared um, communal areas there'll be less opportunity just just to go for a hot chocolate there'll be much more of a routine around that um, as added precautions added cleaning precautions and so on and the um, but also a need to be a community is really important and I, I, I um, and we have that opportunity in the regulations to make that judgment and to risk assess that and that's what most schools are doing and are you having to add in that kind of routine around sort of um uh, kind of downtime and leisure time and prep time all those mm. kinds of times you having to do that all in different ways than you normally would or if you if you it, with horizontal boarding not particularly so uh, prep times uh, the, the girls would normally be or in any school girls boys would be um, in prep rooms or in this in their bedroom studying and that stayed the same because they'll still be in their bubble mm -hmm. um, the main difference they'll feel um, will be that uh, it will be dining, I suspect, that if they uh, are not dining in their in-house bubbles and they're dining centrally, as we do here at Queen Margaret's, then the, um, the bubbles will have to dine separately. Mm -hmm. So there won't be that mixing of the year groups. And we, um, and that, that, of course, has issues when there's siblings at the same school. Mm -hmm. So in the different year groups. And uh, we're uh, looking at how we can provide space for um, sisters, brothers and sisters in other schools that they've just got an opportunity to be together um, safely too so but it will have to be in a separate area so that we don't mix our year groups and mix our bubbles. But generally speaking children wouldn't be mixing unless they're siblings they wouldn't be mixing with children from other year groups. In other year groups yeah yeah, yeah. and yeah. that that's um uh, it seems a shame and i get that that needs to happen for, mm. for kind of physical safety and and, and prevention of, of of spread of the virus but um i always understood that one of the great joys about boarding was those kind of friendships mm. that you make across different year groups but mm. maybe i've misunderstood that i don't know what your take on it is i, I no I, I think that's right um and of course one of the, i think the, the the underpinning that is the the greatest joy one of the joys of boarding is just the community is being one big family yeah. Um, and all schools, I think, are having to look at um, how they um, underpin community in different ways. And a lot of schools looked at that over um, the lockdown. Uh, you know how they how they perpetuate in an online world that sense of community and 
um, lots of examples across the country of um, you know, virtual sports days and um, you know, challenges set by prefects and um, opportunities for different year groups to, to get together online um, and, you know, and, and try to, to, to mesh, the, to keep the community together and mesh it together. And certainly we worked hard on that ourselves. Um, there's still lots more creative thinking to go up to happen, I think, in terms of um, trying to find opportunities for the, for, for the, for the community to come together. Um, where there's a house structure that's vertical, you know, there's no reason why um, you can't operate uh, distanced house meetings or distanced chapels, something like that, where you get an opportunity to come together in a different way, but just not all at the same time. Uh, so it depends on the space you've got. Yes, I guess that's true. And and how readily you're able to, to kind of utilise the technology, I guess, as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Have there been any um, kind of positives that have come about in the, the few weeks um, prior to the summer holidays um, in terms of the shrinking of the world, if you like, via technology mm -hmm. and so on? I think we've all embraced it a bit. Have, you, have there been any benefits there that you think you might hang on to even sort of after this is all over? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think... Um, being able to uh, connect better, especially with our overseas parents, that's certainly improved as a result of, um, of lockdown. Uh, and I don't think we will ever quite go back to parents' meetings the way they were, which is kind of the, the carousel of parents drifting around halls that we're all familiar with as parents ourselves, I think. Yeah. Um, the, the, Zoom, <laughs> the Zoom parents' conference was a, worked really well, more that, better than I think my colleagues thought it would. Um, and it meant that a lot more parents were able to... to speak to teachers and to you know and, and to have a some real input into their child's learning so definitely that's a keeper um, and i think the um some of the some of the, the approaches to learning in general um and also just the um i think we finished the term all of us feeling much more comfortable with this online way of working um and you know and, and feeling able to have conversations um, almost ad hoc on you know, through screens it's not the same as being in a, in a room with somebody but it, it you know if you as you get better at it it improves yes so yes. i think that's part of it and have you used um sort of zoom and those other kind of online technologies to um visit pupils and their families kind of in their homes mm -hmm. which we've so, been able to do before yeah. Yeah, so we've, um, we use, we were Google School, so we use Google Meet as our, our main way of operating and um, all the, the, the girls had a, a weekly one-to-one -one meeting with their tutor every week, mm -hmm. um, so a check-in um, and, uh, and then tutors getting in touch with parents and so on if needs be, so that all, all happened as it would have done in the real, in the real school. And that was certainly really helpful in terms of, of supporting, supporting the pupils because it, ju it just meant that we had a real sense of how they were getting on um, and they were able to share uh, perhaps in a way that they couldn't when they're online with yeah. their peers. They were able to share, you know, well, actually I'm really struggling, I can't upload or, you know, actually mum and dad are really busy and I feel a bit, bit left out at home. Um, you know, there was some, uh, actually some, some um, low level but some important safeguarding um, concerns that arose from some of those conversations just so that, that we could we could speak to parents about and improve um, just the way that the, that the that the children were were getting on so that they were really really making the most of their of their online learning and what have the pupils told you about their um, sort of their concerns or the things that they're looking forward to um, in September? Mm. They are um, to a woman girl. They are desperate to get back to see each other. They really have really, really missed um, their peers, their friends um, and no amount of online chat, either through school or through non-school means. Um, house party and so on none of that has replicated the, the 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 feeling of being together wanting to be together and um, some of them have been really quite lonely um, as a result of being of being away from from school because they because their borders uh, their connections are with their boarding family um, uh, who are scattered far and wide they don't have a local community in the same way around home some of them do 
uh, and some of them are day girls and they or they live relatively close to school and they do pick, you know they, they have been able to support each other but the majority of our girls are, uh, come from all over the world all over the UK and they don't have they didn't have that foothold in their local community where their parents live in the same way so they so there was a real sense there was more of a sense a heightened sense of isolation I think for them for boarding girls than there would have been for for day so they've really really missed you mm, they've, really, yeah, they've missed each other and they've missed <laughs> our, the facility of, of the school to kind of the, basically we facilitate their um social life and their and their interactions with each other and they've missed they've missed that and um as hard as to try as we might at the end of the day you you can't you simply can't replicate online sitting around just having a good old chatter absolutely when you're a teenager and you mentioned before about how you know it was tricky for some of them because it was quite mm. a sudden ending and you know normally presumably when you've had children who've been at the school for a long time then you have to facilitate that ending quite carefully I would imagine mm. but mm. Um, in this instance for some of them it will have been the very end quite mm. quickly and and mm. so how did you kind of manage that and how have you managed the fallout from that? Yeah I, I'm a great believer as you know Pookie I'm a great believer in good endings I think um, you know you, you need to end well and to have it robbed from you, I think rightly made, uh, felt uh, it was the greatest injustice for many of the girls, um, our upper six girls in particular, who were in their last year and were looking forward to a ter their final term of, of, of experiences, not just A-levels, but also the, the speech day and the leavers ball and all the things that go along with that, that coming of age, really. Um, what we did, I mean, we... In the days as the school came to its close um, from the government's regulations, uh, the girls began to head home. Um, uh, but on the very last afternoon, we had about a third to a quarter of the school left. Um, uh, and we gathered in our quiet garden, it's in our grounds here, um, and, and had an end of term service, um, some prayers, some thoughts. Um, and just an opportunity to come together as a community and say goodbye for now, at least. Um, and it was just, it was quite moving, very moving, actually. And it was really important you know, that girls who could attend did and that they could just take that moment. So I promised the upper sick uh, uh, and will stick to it that they would have their, um, their proper end of term ball and so on when, when the time is right, when we're allowed to do that and they can really enjoy that moment. And in fact, I've sent them them a questionnaire asking when they would like it so that I have a sense of of what's right for them oh wow um and the uh, and then for me now the priority is um thinking about a good start and I think bringing the school back together in a slightly different way rather than the sort of usual end of the start of term arrival and find your room and things like that just trying to think of how we can safely um have a little bit of sense of occasion of being back again and trying to bottle some of the joy that there will be in that first 24 hours as the um, as the girls come back to school and what thoughts do you have about that how do you think you might be able to enable that good start uh -huh. so <laughs> we um so some of our ideas uh include i'm um, hoping usually the weather is very good when we come back to school it's always slightly annoying that you know, the first <laughs> couple of weeks of september are always good if it's rained up through throughout august um a bit of a fair actually a bit of a country fate feel to things um so we can um uh keep the distance keep the bubbles keep some we need to keep some control over arrivals and so on but we can um a, we, we've talked about um having picnic campers prepared for families so they can have a bit of a picnic they, they're welcome to stay for as long as they need to in their area in their bubble um whether we you know get a nice screen van in we get some you know get a, a decent coffee van in and just really try to make it a celebration in sort of garden fate type feel is, is kind of where our, our thoughts are going and that's quite um that's very much our kind my kind of school that's how this school Sounds wonderful. feels so <laughs> it'll be different in different places but we've we've also got girls um, overseas girls coming back early because they have to um quarantine Quarant i was weeks. going to ask about that because you've got mm. kids coming from all over the world so what does yeah. that look like practically so practically, that means that we've got girls arriving um, here from the 20th of August uh, and we're going to look after them in their, in, so that they're um, quarantining in familiar surroundings with their friends um, as, they, as they fly back uh, and we'll pick them up from the airport and bring them straight back to school, feed them. We've got a programme of activities and some um, 
additional EAL teaching because some of their English might be a bit rusty after six months yeah. away. Um, and what does quarantine look like? I mean, do they, so they can be together in quarantine. So we've made the decision that they can be, it's not self-isolation and not, none of them will have COVID. Obviously they wouldn't be able to join us if that was the case. Um, but if they, um, so, so they don't need to self-isolate, but they do need to quarantine. So we'll, we'll have them in a, in one of the boarding houses. They can, they'll be in separate rooms, but they'll be able to, um, eat together um uh you know and and uh, and, un and undertake some of these activities bits of sport bits of learning and so on together yeah. too and then we've got a um a covid prepared uh, medical center so that if there are anyone that's taken ill uh or if there's any concerns about their about their health then we can put those um routines into straight into into practice if there's any concerns during quarantine and so the school will be closed quarantine a moment so quarantine is basically mm -hmm. just I, yeah, I don't. What's the difference between self-isolating and quarantine? It's probably mm. you know inside out. But I, <laughs> I so I think that the, the key thing is is that if you are self-isolating, then you, I mean, no one should go near you because you right. have COVID. Okay. So you've got the you've got the symptoms of COVID. You've had a test. You've been told to self-isolate. Um, the the children that are re, that are returning to us are not do are not COVID do not have COVID symptoms. So they are just asked to stay at home to provide, if you, um, it's the same as UK citizens coming back from Spain at the moment, provide yeah. an address um, and stay within that address. The family members in that address don't have to self-isolate, but right. you do have to try to keep away from. So it's thinking of the boarding, of the boarding house as a household. Yeah. They're joining their household. Um, and, then, uh, and then we look after them from that point. They'll get temperature checked every day. Um, our, our medical team will be back on site by the from the 20th as well so that uh, we've got that oversight of their of their quarantine period and we've also we've got a sports camp running here at the moment um but that finishes on the 19th of august so that we've got no one coming onto site other than our yeah. um our staff and, and girls from the 20th and but it with, means with, your staff are having a longer school year and the girls it does yeah, yeah i mean we, we're using um uh an outside company um, who would normally provide a language school anyway during the summer holidays and of course lost that business um wow. they're going to look after the girls during the day okay and give oh, them a really great. good so program provide them with some business as well yes yeah and then we and it's just our staff who look after them pastorally okay okay gosh there's so much to think about isn't there <laughs> And presumably you're having to keep quite a close watching brief on what's happening worldwide with regards mm. to COVID, because mm. it may be that there might be some countries from which we wouldn't, I don't really know. I mean, yeah. Mm. What are you having to think about those things too? So uh, we, I think all schools are, it rather depends, it depends uh, really on the individuals uh, where they're coming from. Yeah. Um, and really following foreign and commonwealth office advice is the uh you know is the only is the only really uh, only game in town um and also having a good um good relationship with the with the local with public health england the local in the local area so that you can take some advice if you need it but um for us most of our girls are from europe our overseas girls are from europe and um from the far east so it's relatively straightforward, but I think if you've got girls that are cut off and boys coming back from South America or from the African continent, then it, it may well be trickier. Or oh, the um, States right now. Even. Yeah, the States, yeah. Yeah. And are you having to, um, so, so you said you've kind of, you've, you've got your um, medical wing is kind of COVID ready mm. as well. So you've had to think mm. quite carefully about that. What does that mean? So that, <laughs> that means that we've got a, we've got zones within the medical area. So um, there's a quite a lot of um, perspex around the school in general. One of the things that I'll be I'll be showing the girls on my YouTube videos, um, so that the medical staff can assess girls as they arrive at the medical centre um, straight away, but safely in terms of what may be wrong. Mm. And then basically our centre is divided into green, amber, and red. So um, green for girls who have uh, no symptoms of COVID. They're not they're not presenting with anything they've you know they've they've, they've sprained their ankle yeah um amber for girls who have symptoms of covid but are yet to be tested mm -hmm. and then red for girls who have had a positive covid test and therefore have to self-isolate um safely and away from everybody else um very i was very keen when we were planning it not to have amber girls with red girls 
um, just thinking it through as a mum, actually, it's very interesting. If you, if you think it through as a, as a parent, um, some of the decisions you make are different from the ones you might think through as a, just as a, as a head. Yeah. Now, as a parent, I didn't want um, uh, my daughter, who may just have turned up with a nasty cold, to be um, put in a red zone with girls who are obviously... Have, who, who are known to have COVID when she may not have COVID at all. She might just have a cold. And that will be the case. Mm. You know, all the usual c- coughs and sniffles and, um, that happen in schools on the return to school in September, you know, there's not the, every teacher in the country will recognise that they get, um, you know, that colds do the rounds in the first month of, of, this, of, the, school, of the autumn term as mm. all the children come back. Um, and that will be the same again. But somehow schools, all schools, whether they're boarding schools or day schools, are going to have to try to work out how they manage um, the, the child that turns up with a slight temperature and a cough that's got a cold and the child that turns up with a temperature and a cough that's got COVID. And how do we know? <laughs> yeah. and, and how do we know? And then from the point of view of boarding, um, how do you look after, and no one's answered this one, um, how do you look after that child? So if the child has it in a day environment, uh, if, you, if you as a school are concerned that the child may have COVID-19, then you, you'll ring the parents. They'll be in a, in a room isolated. You'll ring the parents, ask the parents to come take the child and, and have them tested and keep them at home until the test comes back. In a boarding school, we are the parents. Yeah. Um, but we don't have access to testing on site. So uh, we have to, so one of my staff will have to drive the child to a testing station or we'll have to await a test. And while we're awaiting a test, we don't know how long it'll take for the test to arrive. Mm. And we've got to try and look after a very scared wow. young person. So you know, who hasn't got, you know, hasn't got mum saying, be fine, don't worry. You know, we can do all that, but it's not quite the same as your mum saying that. And, um, and we've got, to, you know, and the, the thought of, and I think, again, for all schools, this is the case. If you, um, the moment you suspect that a, that a child has COVID-19, then your medical staff don full PPE. Now, if you're 12 years old, Leave aside if you're much younger, but if you, you know, there's prep, certainly prep schools that board, they'll have younger children than that. But if you're 10, 12 years old, even if you're 14, actually, and somebody, somebody says, well, I think you might have COVID, I'm like, hang on a minute, and, and they come back fully with the proper medical PPE on, I think that's really scary. Yeah, that is scary. And, you, you know, and, uh, and um, somehow we've got to, as schools, prepare the children for that without frightening them too much and making it feel that they're in some kind of alien environment. You know, they're still in hope, at hope. But that's the reality. The reality is, is that the person who is um, dealing with them is meant to, the medical professional dealing with them, is meant to wear full PPE. Wow. Um, Gosh. So, <laughs> and, I, I, you, it, and, and there are barriers the whole time. This is barriers, barriers, barriers. At the very moment when the, the thing you want to do as a caring individual, human being, really, is not have the barriers. You know, it'll be all right. You'll be fine. But we just need to... It's really hard to communicate that when you're Very in visor, mask, yeah. or surgical gown. And I, I, there's no... I, I don't... I, you know, I, I think we've all kind of pushed that to the back of our minds over the last few months when we've, since the regulations came out in the beginning of July because it... I suppose you it's have a horrible to, thought. It, yeah, you hope it doesn't happen, but at the yeah. same time, you have to be completely prepared for what if it does, don't you? Well, we do, and I think you know we would. I was reflecting on this uh, with a colleague earlier today. You know, at the beginning of the summer holidays, uh, every, we, I think na- nationally we felt quite positive. You know, we were coming out of lockdown. The the, the rates seemed to be improving. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I was I was wondering whether I'd been too too cautious in some of my my decision making. Um, and yet, as we're talking now at the end of July, um, you know, the talks for second wave in Europe, the sense that really things are not quite as controlled as we might like. And, and therefore, actually, probably we do need to think about some of these things. That, you know, these things will be a reality for us in, in September. Um, and managing a student well-being um, and, and also stopping, particularly in a girls' school, but in all schools, actually, the drama <laughs> so someone gets 
<laughs> so, you know, someone has it, someone sneezes. Oh my gosh, they got COVID. Oh my goodness, we're gonna, you know, and just trying to manage and, 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 and educate. And how are you planning on that? I mean, have you thought, are you mm. building this into some of your sort of PSHE curriculum and, mm. and, and that kind of thing? Or? Mm. So building it into our PSHE curriculum, um, building it into our first, into the first few days back. Mm. Um, some schools I know, have, uh, you know, have got a very different first um, start to their term. They're not having a normal timetable. They're really giving um, their children time to come together and get to, and get to know each other again, really, and just uh, you know, and feel and feel comfortable in their in in their environment. And um, and we'll do the same. But I think we feel like I want to feel my way a bit. I think there's going to be so there's going to be such a diversity of experience amongst the girls. Yes. Uh, and I think generalizing could be the worst possible for everybody. So I think it's just really, and unfortunately it's a relatively small school that we can be quite individual in how we, and how we support everybody. And age wise too, it'd be very different. How you support an 11 year old is going to be very different from how you support mm -hmm. a 17 year old. Yeah. And I think everyone, you know, it's one of the things I keep coming back to. Everyone's going to have a different story to tell. And some of those stories mm. will be positive and some will be negative mm. and many will be somewhere in the middle. But I think mm. particularly in a close knit community like yours, but where people have been scattered all over the world and across the country, that there will be hugely different experiences. And I would imagine mm. there'll be a great appetite for hearing what each other has been up to and mm. what that's actually looked like as well. Mm. And I think, um, you know, and allowing people to share that and also not to judge that because, I mean, teenagers are very worried about how, you know, what will everybody think if I say, well, basically I spent most of my lockdown you know, bird watching. Yeah. And I had one of my girls has done exactly that. She's had a fantastic oh. time. Oh, and, wow. the, um, you know, and others who've had, who perhaps live in, in cities and have had a very different experience um, as a result of quite a close lockdown in their, in their, in their country. Mm. Um, and, and, and everything in between, um, but all of those are valid experiences. Um, and actually sharing that is a good way to bring the community back together um, and giving opportunity for that sharing and, you know, and legitimizing that, um, I think is quite important. And do you have any kind of expectations on what your girls should have been doing and how they should have used that time? Because one of the things that I've been hearing, and I've heard it a lot from adult friends, but increasingly from teenagers, is this idea that so many people have, you know, learned a new skill or written that novel finally or whatever during yeah. lockdown. And there's this very idealized <laughs> view of what should have happened. I mean, I don't know about you, I've basically just been trying desperately not to sink. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that that, no, and I think that that, and actually I think that's the majority of people, that's exactly what's happened. It's been about just trying to keep going. Mm. Um, and I, uh, and no, I, so I have no expectations. I think basically, if, you know, the joy will be that we're simply together. Yeah. And, um, and, you, uh, you, and we live, and some of us won't realize what positive experiences we've had until years down the line. Mm. Um, and, you know, and others will feel, um, I wonder some of the I think some of the girls and the families will feel a little bit bereft actually that, that this is over you know they've had a very, you know, they've had a, a special time mm. which they never thought they were going to get together and, and and coming back into boarding coming back into routines will will feel a little bit like the end of something the end of an era almost yeah, of like, six I guess months of being a family yeah particularly for your boarders I mean it will be the longest they've mm. spent as a family for years for some mm. of them won't some it? of them yeah and for some of them that's been a real joy for others that's been quite tricky yeah um you know some of them don't want to be <laughs> home with their parents for six months and um and I and I and I'm concerned too um to support my families not just my girls um because I what I'm worry is a strong word but it I'm concerned that the actually the parents and the mums are going to struggle a bit with all of this yeah you know, it isn't just about the girls it's actually about the family and the and mums who've you know, perhaps connected with their daughters in a way that they hadn't anticipated even mums who um you know your boarding is absolutely what they do you know, you know boarding families through and through really believe in it love it so glad the girls are back but actually just that sense of mm. yeah you know now my girl's gone and do you think there will be more kind of separation anxiety? I mean, presumably you get some degree of that when, when children come back to boarding each year anyway, mm, but do you mm, think it might mm, be more so this year? Mm, I think so. I anticipate that. Having said that, I don't want to judge anybody. I do anticipate more of that. Yeah. Um, and, and I know, sharing with you earlier, you know, my daughter, um, who will be 10 in September, she's boarded, just been a flexi-boarder for a couple of, for, for a year, 
for a couple of nights a week and um and certainly that's been an uh, the separation and just the attachment and so on has definitely changed as a result of of this um uh, and you know in the end in a good way i think i'm not it's it, it but it but it has changed and and i think as parents um, and as educators uh being just cognizant of it and aware of it will help us to support the girls and their families and the children and their families when they come back to school and also to be aware of it not in the first 48 hours of joy mm. and excitement but actually in that downward yeah right oh right so i really can't uh, you know sit and supper with my, with with mini molly and mandy yeah, yeah. and it, and you, 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 that things. Oh, right, this really is different. You know, and, oh, right, well, mum, you know, mum's, mum stayed a couple of perhaps. You know, quite often, parents will stay a couple of nights nearby, mm. and then head, and then head off. Um, and when they know their parents have, had, have gone back home and so on, I think that's the time when we'll be, um, we'll need our reserves of emotional energy to support the girls, and, you know, and, and, and girls and boys. I can imagine that will be quite tricky. And what you said you, you were, and I completely empathise with the idea of, of needing to think about how to support the families as well as the, the, the girls, the children. Mm -hmm. what, what will you be doing? I mean, what does that look like? I think we've tried throughout the lockdown to do that. So plenty of communication um, with families. Um, I, I, I think frequent and, um, and not too wordy if you can, if you can manage it. And some of my... Um, communications last term were video rather than letter okay um, and just trying to connect that's nice. um, with them a little bit more um i think trying to make the start of term the dropping off as humane as possible in a situation that will feel less than that yeah. um normally parents would uh, part of the of the rite of passage almost is that you know you take you go up to the dorm and you help you do, your, your child unpack and get things put away and you sit on the bed and, and none of that's possible. No. Um, uh, and so that, what could be a very sterile and difficult start, um, that's really why the, and that again was where the, where the sort of garden fate idea has come from, is just trying to find ways to um, reach out to parents and make, uh, you know, and realise that, you know, we're still the welcoming place we've always have been and, um, and, and, and find ways and opportunities and routines that en enable parents to be part of their children's life, yeah. uh, even if they can't physically be in the same room. You know you're going to have to budget for that fate every year. I know. <laughs> I know if it's too good, I'll have to do it every year. <laughs> <laughs> a it's lovely problem to have. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, you know, if I had to like, you know, buy some more bunting, that's a small price to pay. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> for, uh, for for getting it right. Um, Maybe you could have the girls who are coming back early for quarantine make it in the evenings. Or uh, yeah, yeah, no, you're right. And the, and it's just that sense of um, you know, of joy. Yeah, you. Know, it's not been an entirely joyless experience lockdown for for most of us. You know, there's been times of great strain I, for everybody, um, but not but not wholly. Yeah. Um, and for those and for those um, families where schools are aware that that has been a particular difficulty, then you know th there's already a lot of support and work going in there yeah. to support those families already. But um, to try and bring some joy back into being together, I yeah. think you know as lockdown eased, we found that as just as individuals and as families and friends, you just having being able to have a socially distant distance barbecue suddenly became a really lovely thing to do, which had been routine before. We so we I think it's valuing knowing what to value. It, it's interesting, hasn't it? I think it's yeah. I think it's just been a if nothing else, it has been a moment of real reflection and mm. working out what really matters. And mm. I think when everything's suddenly taken away, you do appreciate certain things and you realise the things that really really matter to you, don't you? Mm. Um, and, and, yeah. Uh, and that's true for the, and that's true for young people as well as it, as much as it is for for parents and adults. Mm. Um, and I think they've, you know, and, and certainly talking to some of my girls, um, you know, that that really has been part of their of their thinking. You know, what is it that matters? Things that really matter. And some of the girls, we've been at the sports camp actually. Some of my girls, and they, you know, I just can't wait to get back to school. I just want to see Mrs. So and So. I just want to, you know, the, the, some of the very smallest things. Some of the very, you know, some of the very routine interactions, the things that they've most missed. Yeah. 
And obviously pa the pandemic isn't the only thing that's been relevant mm -hmm. during this time. So the other like massive agenda for everyone, but teens in particular seem to be really keen on it is the kind of the Black Lives Matter yeah. kind of movement. Um, and is that something that's kind of coming up for your girls? And is it something you'll be looking to specifically address on their return? Mm -hmm. I mean, we addressed that very specifically during last term. So during the George, uh, George Floyd protests and so on, we were very, um, some assemblies, um, my head of history did a great uh, presentation and so on on, on uh, the impact of black lives on British history. Mm -hmm. And uh, we made some changes ready for this term in terms of our approach to diversity um, and our uh, you know, and a, and a, and a look at um, how we, how and what we teach. Um, so for up for us, there is a con it's a continuum, uh, mm -hmm. and the, and certainly the girls appreciated the opportunity to um, think deeply yeah. about the issues that the that the protests raise that Black Lives Matter raises and will continue to raise. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we had a, one of our, one of the senior prefects was always the senior prefect international. Um, and I'd already made a decision to um, change that to inclusion. Uh, because I think it's also raised uh, for our girls and I think probably most school communities, not just issues around Black Lives Matter, but also um, issues ar around the, the support and the approach that we give to um, to families, young people of all kinds, of all genders, of all types, um, and you know, and and indeed, my own sort of passion around supporting mental health in young people. Um, you just just allowing converse, proper conversation, the same way that Black Lives Matter encourages us to have proper and deep and difficult conversations. Um, the same is true and should be true to facilitate a number of conversations about all kinds of things. Um, and has that agenda been, was that sort of driven by um, staff and kind of, you know, seeing that this is a, you know, issue for everyone or was this driven mm. by your students? Or was it kind of a combination of the two? It's a combination of the two. Um, our students, my girls were particularly, uh, you know, are particularly aware of their privilege. Um, and I'm very proud of the fact that they, that they recognise their privilege. Mm -hmm. um, and what they want to learn is how best they use it for the right in the right way um, and I, I think um, children in schools such as mine um, you know, they are socially engaged and they are um, deeply ethical mm. uh, and they put, sometimes put, put us as, uh, as teachers and adults to shame with that real passion and sense of of right and wrong but what they want to do they've got you know we, we we say this you know our job is to educate young people to think for themselves and then we shouldn't be surprised when they have thoughts we don't like they, they are allowed to have <laughs> allowed to think that's the whole point we're not meant to come out of education having a you know that being stereotypes of every, uh, you know the teachers that taught them they're meant to come out as free thinking and deeply thinking uh, young people uh, who who want to make who want to affect change and make a difference in their own lives and other people's? So when they turn around to you and say, uh, "We think the school should be doing more for this," then you you, you have to listen because partly because they're that that's your success. Yeah. If, they're, if they're questioning what you if they're questioning and asking you you know what, challenging you on your um, on your standpoint, then then we're doing a good job. Um, and the, the last thing we should be doing as educators is just uh, well, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, you, know, you, know, you just don't understand. No schools can never possibly do that. Just go right. Tell me what it is you really. Want. What is it you want this? But why do you want it? Tell me that. Explain that to me, and then we'll see what we can do. And presumably, as your girls return in the autumn, then you'll be thinking really carefully about how to kind of continue to engage with them to find out how things are impacting. Because we don't mm. really know, do we? I mean, we, we're making best guesses right now, and you're clearly planning really carefully, but we don't know what's going to happen next or how this might impact on them or what might be happening at home for some of them. And mm. they might have fears about, you know, what's happening back at home if they're away. Mm. And, and I think, um, you know, uh, one of my concerns as an educator, as an educator, not just as a head teacher, but as an educator, is that we 
have you've completely understandably have concentrated on how we support um, the most vulnerable children yeah. and how we support the most vulnerable families. That's absolutely right. Don't hurt it. But um, we that what about the what about the children who and the families who just said no, we're fine, mm -hmm. um, but actually aren't. And we've no, you know we've we've known pre COVID we've known that that is how um, the, the 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 real difficulty. In, you know, in supporting families and young people, particularly um, in terms of mental health, you know, I, I don't think you are fine, actually. No. You know, there's, something that, you know, there's something not right. You just don't see yourself. You don't, you know, well, your friends have said that they're a bit concerned about you. And, oh, oh, oh. and we found ways over the last 10 years to open up those conversations and encourage young people and families to talk more openly about their mental health and for friends to come forward. I saw that so much in the, in the last 10 years of the increase of friends coming and saying, we're really concerned about so-and-so. Um, and the same is true for the COVID experience. So yes, we need to support the most vulnerable children um, and, and families, uh, those that have been shielding, those that have, 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 have suffered bereavements, those who, we, we, we know about, those and we know we've got to do something for them but what about the ones who just look you just say no i'm fine and you and you come to see over the course of a week or a week month that, that really isn't the case yeah and, and what you know, and how do we support them and we already are pushed to support the others as well as teach and try to make up some of the um the ground that some of them will have lost through through being away from school not you know, Home learning has worked really well for quite a few schools, but not for all, but not necessarily for all individuals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of challenges there, aren't there? And, and like mm -hmm. you, actually, I'm worried, and yeah, both in the context of COVID and more generally about the quiet ones in the middle. They're the ones that really worry me now. I think we've always been good at the vocal minority and those whose behaviour kind of challenges in whatever way we hear them. And the, the vulnerable, we now are pretty good at picking up and, and thinking how do we support how do we enable those voices to be heard but it's the quiet ones in the middle that are just skirting by under the radar they worry me mm. the most um, mm. and yeah I think you're right in this context too so maybe they haven't been directly bereaved or directly affected in ways that are obvious to us but that perhaps there's stuff going on there mm. is the um uh, are you, you having any changes in terms of the kids who are boarding have you had people who are no longer going to board or newcomers like has that um sort of changed as a result of, of this mm. current picture or is it broadly as you would expect in any normal year broadly it's as we would expect we've um ha we've we've introduced a, a simplified um covid timetable for september sort of learning the lessons of our similarly simplified timetable last term so we have a temporary timetable operating um, for the first term, probably for the first term, um, which means that they, for, board, for us, there'll be no Saturday morning academic lessons. And in boarding schools, that's normal. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so our, less, our academic lessons will finish on a, on a Friday, at the end of school on a Friday. Um, there will be, uh, the schools open on Saturday, there'll be some guided sport, there'll be um, opportunities to go to the art room and carry on with your art and, and so on, but there won't be any um, timetable lessons. And the result is that some of the families, our families have decided that for the short term in, that, in this different timetable, they're going to weekly board, so their girls will go home at weekends. Um, but that's the, uh, really the only change that we've seen, otherwise uh, it's very much um, business as usual for our families, actually. They've um, obviously, they, 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 they're, they're carrying on supporting us and supporting their daughters in, the, in whichever system they were operating before. So some girls were full boarders, some girls were day boarders, boarded yeah. one night a week, that kind of thing. And, um, and just um, finally, you, in terms of new children who are new to boarding, um, mm -hmm. are you doing anything different uh, for them than you would normally to help them sort of transition in at this time? Or is it your usual kind of transition process? We've done what we can in our usual transition process. They really missed out um, with their new, we have a new girls day in June where they would normally have come into school and they would have um, spent some time in, their board, in the boarding house. We have a junior boarding house that would have spent some time there. They would have met some of their teachers, they would have met the girls, the mums would have met each other, which is also quite an important part of the settling in process. Yeah. Um, we had a virtual, we had a new girls week where they dipped in and out of various things that were going on, um, which helped some of them, but I'm sure didn't help all of them as much as, it, as they would like. Mm. Um, 
many of the things that we're doing for all the girls apply for, you know, the same we can do for the, I don't think there's, I, I think I, I've basically gone for, a, I want to help everybody as much as I can. So the, so the video walkthroughs for all the girls, there'll be a few extra ones for the new girls um, and some more introductions and some more personal videos and some of the, some of their key staff so they can um, have a sense of, you know, of what people look like and what the name of the dog is and things like that. Yeah. Um, and uh, we'll just uh, try to um, help them as much as we can and also just support them and support the, uh, their families. I know it's something that their families are worried about, of course, because they haven't had that same, same introduction. But, that, but without physically being in school, mm. it's very, very difficult yeah. to, to, do, to, do, to do more. Yeah. It sounds like you've got great measures in place, though, and I think mm. that often it's the case isn't it that young people actually just they manage these things so tremendously well and I think sometimes <laughs> it's the families that find it harder isn't there's it a, there's a danger to it that we overthink it yeah and um, you know and um and I think quite it, the very bottom line is that it's just quite simply be um as positive and as open and as joyful as possible it's yeah. kind of the way I go about things so um, you know, where 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 we can use humor, use humor. There's no reason why the walk, you know, these video, my little video walkthroughs can't be with the dog, and uh, you know, and 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 kind of here's another piece of perspex. How many is that in this video? Just things that can <laughs> just help to just to just to kind of bring a bit of a sense of, of personality and fun back. You yeah. know, because there's a lot of regulation and perspex screens do not make you feel joyful. No no it's the it's people that make you feel joyful and if one thing there's one thing that boarding schools do really well is people you know that's what right in the the, the cut them through the middle change you can change the change the staff around but ultimately the community is still in at its heart is a you know is, is what the place is about is the beating heart of a place in a boarding school so i love working in them um in a you know and and, and it's remembering that and using that as the as the basis for everything else that comes what thought would you like to close with what thought would you like people mm -hmm. who've been listening to to go away with i think i would finish just by saying uh the most important things to do to prepare if you're preparing your uh, child to go back to boarding is to let them talk about their um their their, their expectations let them talk about their fears um, don't just brush aside go oh it'll be fine let let them express how they're how they're feeling about boarding including if they're just saying do you know what mum I can't wait to get away from you it, it all of those things are quite important so just have a re have really open conversations engage with the schools um, many of the schools will be doing as we're doing sending videos and and, and and pamphlets and leaflets and all kinds of things to try and help with the communication engage with those um, use them and don't be afraid as we get towards the beginning of September to pick up the phone and, and, and talk to your, to, to your child's school. Um, you, we don't mind. The more, com the more conversations we have, then the better it's going to be. Mm -hmm.